is a rude awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, whale offsets. What is that about? Well, it was a topic of discussion at COP26. I'll speak to marine biologist and professor at the University of Alaska Southeast, Dr. Heidi Pearson, and assistant director at the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Ralph Chami, to get some of those lingering questions answered. But first, the news. I'm Eileen Alfandari with KTFA News Headlines. The House of Representatives erupted in cheers this morning as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced passage of the hard-fought Build Back Better legislation of social and climate programs. On this vote, the yeas are 220, the nays are 213, the Build Back Better bill is passed. All Democrats but one, Jared Golden of Maine, voted for the measure. Every Republican voted no. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy delayed passage last night when he launched an eight-and-a-half-hour speech against the measure, setting a new record for the length of a House speech. You know, when I look at this bill, it angers me. We are so better than this. You are spending so much money, never before. We spent less defeating Hitler, Mussolini, and Japan than you're spending tonight. We spent less, but it cost us lives. And you're celebrating it. McCarthy's lengthy speech pushed the final outcome to this morning, but couldn't change the vote. The 2100 page bill's initiatives include bolstering child care assistance, creating free preschool, curbing seniors' prescription drug costs, and beefing up efforts to slow climate change. Pelosi closed debate on the $1.85 trillion bill early this morning, describing it as historic. That is historic, transformative, and larger than anything we have ever done before. We are building back better. If you are a parent, a senior, a child, a worker, if you are an American, this bill, this bill's for you. Passage in the House sends the legislation to an uncertain future in the Senate. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has promised to vote before Christmas. The Senate is stalled on moving forward on a final vote on the whopping $778 billion military policy bill. The bill is being held up not because of its cost, but because Republicans want to add amendments on issues like limiting imports of goods produced in China by forced labor and barring payments to migrants who are separated from their children at the border. Massachusetts Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren, though, took aim at the record spending for the military, more than under former President Trump and even more than the Biden administration requested. She contrasted the glide path for military spending to the hard slog in passing the social and climate programs in the Build Back Better legislation. Congress keeps the spigot of cash wide open so long as it's for defense. Meanwhile, Do you know how much money the president's Build Back Better plan will cost on average each year if Congress passes it? $175 billion. That is about one-fifth the size of this defense bill. When we want to make investments that directly benefit people across this country, we're told that costs too much or that's socialism. But when we spend nearly five times that amount of money in the defense bill, it is just a shrug of the shoulders. Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. The city of Aurora, Colorado, reportedly has agreed to pay $15 million to the family of Elijah McClain to settle a federal civil rights lawsuit filed over his death in police custody. Three police officers and two paramedics have been indicted on manslaughter and other charges in the 2019 death. The 23-year-old black man died after being put in a chokehold and injected with a massive dose of a powerful sedative. Police stopped McLean, who was a massage therapist, as he walked home from a store after a 911 caller reported a man wearing a ski mask and waving his hands seemed sketchy.
Defense attorneys for the three men accused of killing black jogger Ahmaud Arbery rested their case after calling a total of seven witnesses. The people who testified in the men's defense included Travis Mike Michael, who fatally shot Arbery, he says in self-defense. Six neighbors testified about their concerns regarding crime in the neighborhood. McMichael and his father, Greg, armed themselves and pursued the 25-year-old Arbery in a pickup truck. A neighbor, William Roddy Bryan, joined the chase in his own truck and recorded cell phone video. The three defendants are white. Eleven of the 12 jurors are white as well. Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis has signed a sweeping legislative package preventing businesses in the state from complying with federal vaccination mandates or adopting such mandates on their own. No nurse, no firefighter, no police officer, no trucker, no anybody should lose their job because of these COVID jabs. And that's what we're doing. We're making sure that people have a right to earn a living, people have a right to have protections uh, in their place of employment, and that parents have protections to be able to direct the upbringing of their kids. Florida Democrats have criticized the new laws as politically motivated and dangerous to public health. By the end of the day, the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention may recommend the use of booster vaccines for all adults. An advisory committee to the CDC meets next hour. Early this morning, the Food and Drug Administration recommended booster doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. At least 17 states led by California have recommended all adults receive a booster if they're at least six months out from their two-dose Moderna or Pfizer vaccinations or two months after their J&J inoculation. The World Health Organization has in vain urged wealthy nations to hold off on booster doses for their general populations, while many poor countries still lack the doses to give their people a first jab. On the second day of a two-day sympathy strike at Kaiser, nurses will walk off the job today. Yesterday, tens of thousands of Kaiser workers from SCIU United Healthcare Workers West held a one-day sympathy strike to support striking Kaiser Local 39 operating engineers. The engineers have been on strike for two months. 2,000 mental health clinicians will also hold a one-day sympathy strike today. They're drawing their attention to demand their demand that Kaiser fix what the mental health workers workers call its broken mental health care system. Weather forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area. Slight chance of morning showers, mostly cloudy skies, highs in the low 60s. In Fresno in the central San Joaquin Valley, a dense fog advisory until 11, clearing to sunshine, highs in the mid 60s. I'm Eileen Alfandiri, more news at 94.1 with headlines at noon, 3 and 4. Join us at 6 for the Pacifica Evening News. Welcome back. Welcome. This is a rude awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. Whale offsets. Blue carbon. The Conference of Parties 2021. What do they all have in common? Well, they were on the lips of discussion at this year's COP26 and the idea of blue carbon or the use of marine organisms to sequester carbon, specifically whales, is beginning to come into focus. And uh, I'm going to stop it right there and here to talk about it in depth. We have Dr. Heidi Pearson. Dr. Heidi Pearson is an associate professor of marine biology at the University of Alaska Southeast. She studies the behavior and ecology of marine mammals and their role in maintaining healthy ecosystems. And she has specifically studied blue carbon, the concept of marine organisms sequestering carbon. Now, she has an amazing article and the periodical, theconversation.com, entitled Sea Creatures Store Carbon in the Ocean. Um, could protecting them help slow climate change? Now, that's from April 17, 2019. So it's like, wait a minute, that's two years ago, two and a half years ago. It's as if she wrote the article last week. So I want to welcome Dr. Heidi Pearson here to talk about uh, the science side of this whole blue carbon movement. Dr. Pearson, thank you so much for being on A Root Away. Awakening. Thank you, Sabrina. I'm very happy to be here. All right. And Angie also co-wrote an article with Dr. Ralph Chami. Now, Dr. Ralph Chami is the assistant director for the, is the assistant director for the Institute. Excuse me, hold on a second. 
is the Assistant Director of Institute for Capacity Development at the International Monetary Fund. And Dr. Ralph Chami and Dr. Heidi Pearson co-wrote this article, along with their other colleagues, uh, for the IMF entitled Nature's Solution for Climate Change, which came out in December of 2019. It's a fairly new concept, of course. Um, but uh, this has been on the minds of scientists and it's been on the mind of, of the, the folks over at the IMF. So we're going to talk to him after we talk to Dr. Heidi Pearson. Dr. Ralph Tomey, I want to welcome you to the show as well. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. All right. So, Dr. Heidi Pearson, let's uh, let's get down with the sciencey side of all of this, this blue carbon movement. Um, describe how the whales have been contributing to this global carbon sequestration. Thanks for that question, Sabrina. And if I may just make one clarifying point to your wonderful introduction earlier, um, Ralph and his colleagues wrote that article uh, that was published through IMF, but I was not a part of that. So just to clarify that, Ralph has other wonderful co-authors on that work, but I was not one of them. But but it's based on work by Heidi and, and other colleagues. Oh, okay. uh, Heidi's work very much underpins this work. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you for the clarification, both of you. All right, let's knock this ball out the park. Go ahead, Dr. Pearson. So your question was, how do whales contribute to carbon sequestration? So just to talk about the phrase carbon sequestration briefly, we're talking about getting carbon from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into the ocean and getting it into the ocean where it's trapped for 100 years or more. That's what we're really talking about with carbon sequestration. And whales have an amazing ability to do this naturally. And they do this in several different ways. They can uh, store carbon in their body. So they're mammals just like us. And a big part of their body is made up of the element carbon. And whales live for a long time. And they're also very big. You can think of large whales like big trees on land, like your redwoods or sequoias. Those trees on land are big. They live a long time. They store carbon. And that's what whales do as well. So that's one way that whales can take carbon out of the atmosphere. And then if we think about those big, long living whales, um, when they die, like all life does, their carcasses oftentimes sink to the seafloor. And this is really important because then that is an opportunity for that carbon that used to be in the atmosphere to now be deposited at the bottom of the ocean. And at the bottom of the ocean, that carbon can stay there for hundreds to thousands of years, maybe even longer. So those are two of the ways that whales can help to sequester carbon. And then they also have abilities to sequester carbon uh, through spurring uh, the, the growth of phytoplankton, which are tiny marine plants that also take in carbon dioxide. All right. And then there is the phytoplankton. All right. That is, um, that's amazing. That is amazing. And it, uh, it reminds me of, um, my uh, some of my remedial science classes, right? That's like the first thing you learn when you learn uh, delving into uh, biology or delving into marine biology is uh, you learn about the whales. Um, let's talk a little bit more. Let's drill down a little bit more on this whole the, the phytoplankton side of things. Um, because that is extremely important. Um, what is their what is their main connection to the whale population? So phytoplankton are they're really important to um, the ocean and also to all life on Earth. Uh, so phytoplankton are tiny marine plants that photosynthesize just like our plants on land, and so they are taking in carbon dioxide and making um, sugar basically, and also releasing oxygen and these phytoplankton, they need nutrients to grow. So just like you might add fertilizer to your garden, that fertilizer contains nutrients such as nitrogen. Well, nitrogen is also really important for phytoplankton. And these nutrients that phytoplankton need, they occur naturally in the ocean, uh, but in some parts of the world, those nutrients aren't present at very high levels. And so what whales do is they naturally deposit many of these nutrients that phytoplankton need to grow. 
And you might be thinking, how do whales deposit these nutrients? Well, they excrete them through their body as waste. Um, so their poop actually contains very high levels of these nutrients like nitrogen, iron, and phosphorus that these phytoplankton need to grow. So when we see populations of whales in areas that are feeding and, and pooping out these nutrients, then we expect to see larger growth of phytoplankton. And that's good. <laughs> that is good for us folks. That is wonderful. So there is there there's this process where there's this um, there is a process that the whales are a part of in the creation of the phytoplankton uh, in the basic the, the overall sequestration of carbon dioxide of CO two and it's basically the whale pump where it's it's pumping the water, bringing, bringing the phytoplankton to the surface, um, the whale conveyor belt, and then you've got this whole biomixing carbon. Talk to us about those, those three segments of, of, this, uh, of the process of carbon sequestration by whales. Certainly, and I'm glad you mentioned all of those terms. Uh, so the whale pump, the great whale conveyor belt, and the, the third process we're calling biomixing carbon. So the process that I explained previously with the whales feeding and then pooping out those nutrients that enable phytoplankton to grow, that's called the whale pump. And it's called a pump because the whales are actively pumping or bringing these nutrients to the surface that wouldn't normally be there. And so going back to phytoplankton, if we think about these, these tiny cells, they live in the surface waters of the ocean. And some of these nutrients that they need will naturally sink to the bottom of the ocean. So what the whales do is they pump up, they bring up these nutrients, deposit them on the surface so that these phytoplankton can then grow. Um, so that's, that's the whale pump. The other mechanism that you mentioned, Sabrina, is the great whale conveyor belt, which is a really uh, cool system, which capitalizes on the natural migratory movements that whales do. Uh, so I study humpback whales here in Alaska, and so I usually go to humpback whales as my example. So humpback whales in southeast Alaska, um, they're up here during the summer feeding. Uh, they eat lots of things like herring, other types of fish and krill. And then during the winter, they migrate to their breeding grounds, and most of them migrate to Hawaii. And beautiful tropical areas like Hawaii are actually pretty poor in those nutrients that phytoplankton need to grow. And this is where the whales come in. So the whales are naturally moving back and forth between these rich foraging grounds and then these nutrient poor breeding grounds. And when the whales are on the breeding grounds, they're still excreting waste products. Um, they probably aren't pooping as much on the breeding grounds because they're fasting. They're not eating on the breeding grounds, but they're still peeing and you know releasing other waste products. They're releasing, uh, they're shedding their skin. When mothers give birth, there's the afterbirth that's released into the water. So there's still these nutrients that are being released into the surface waters. And we think that there's maybe even a bigger impact of these whale released nutrients in these low latitude areas because they're typically very poor in nutrients. And then you have the whales come in and they inject these high concentrations of nutrients, which in turn causes phytoplankton to grow and builds up the bottom of the food web. And then the third mechanism that you mentioned was uh, what we're calling biomixing carbon. And this is, hasn't been that well studied yet, um, but the idea is that whales, by naturally moving up and down throughout the water column as they naturally dive and then come to the surface to breathe, they are mixing up the surface waters. And when they're mixing up those surface waters, they're bringing those nutrients that would naturally sink to depth. They're bringing them back towards the surface. And again, when we get more nutrients in surface waters, that then allows phyto phytoplankton to grow, feed the bottom of the food web, and also importantly, take in more carbon dioxide. Wow, I just, with this refresher course here, <laughs> this detailed refresher course on what whales do, I feel smarter. I want to go whale watching. <laughs> Folks, that is the voice of Dr. Heidi Pearson. She was just breaking it down to us. Um, what whales do and... Uh, 
why they're so amazing, uh, along with being beautiful. Dr. Heidi Pearson is an associate professor of marine biology at the University of Alaska Southeast. She studies the behavior and ecology of marine mammals and their role in maintaining healthy ecosystems. And she has specifically studied blue carbon, the concept of marine organisms, and sequestering carbon. Let's see here. Now, let's, because uh, we're getting ready to change course here and... Um, switch gears just a little bit. Now, Dr. Pearson, talk to us about the efforts to quantify marine vertebrae carbon. Um, it's still, of course, like I said, and like I've been saying, and like I will keep saying, it's still in its infancy, but the numbers and the findings can be used to apply mitigation strategies and the like to this climate crisis. Talk to us about uh, the quantification of a marine vertebrae carbon. Absolutely. And I think you said it very well, Sabrina, that we are still getting more and more scientific information. Our understanding is in its infancy, but we're continuing to build upon the knowledge base that we do have. And there has only been a handful of studies that have actually quantified these natural things that whales do in terms of how much carbon they can sequester. And these studies have focused just on a handful of species of whales and also in just a handful of areas. So we have a lot more to do, but we, I think we know how to do it. We just need to have the resources to do more of these studies. But what we're finding in the studies that have quantified the amount of carbon that whales can sequester is that it can potentially be a lot and a really interesting comparison, I think, is to consider what whales used to do before they were heavily exploited by commercial whaling and what they do now in terms of uh, these blue carbon processes. And we know that through heavy exploitation of most of the world's great whale populations that we're seeing about a 95% or so decrease in the amount of carbon that is naturally sequestered by these populations. And it's hard to put a firm number on that yet, because as I said, we still just have a handful of studies that have really drilled down to these carbon numbers. But we do know that their, their impact was likely orders of magnitude higher in terms of sequestering carbon before large scale commercial whaling. And so the the conservation and policy implication then is that if we do have conservation measures in place to protect whales and rebuild their populations, maybe even approaching to what they were naturally before commercial whaling was at such a large scale, then we will likely see a much larger ability for these animals to naturally sequester carbon. Wow, wow, wow. And this is all wonderful. It's all positive. And this is a great, great, great thing. However, <laughs> however, big ag is looming its ugly head over this whole situation of trying to save the whales. Um, how, how do you ask, dear listener? We're going to find out in just a bit. I want to thank Dr. Heidi Pearson. Hopefully, she'll stick around. Dr. Pearson, can you hang out for a little bit uh, while we talk to Dr. Jomi? After this break? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Wonderful. Folks, stay tuned. We're going to continue this conversation on Blue Carbon.
tide is low for men and spirits I put aside the yearning of my voice when I was young We'll find each other where we promise We are back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. We're continuing the conversation on the whole blue wave, blue carbon movement, but we're going to switch it over. We're going to switch gears here and talk about the economics of it all. Um, Of course, we just had the big old conference of parties, the one that's been happening year after year. This year it was in Glasgow, COP26. And... uh, All the leaders of the world were there, which includes, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on the side of the coin you're on, Big Ag, these multinational corporations that uh, have been running roughshod on the so-called developing countries. Um, And here to talk about uh, the possible uh, or excuse me, uh, commodification of the whole blue carbon movement is Dr. Ralph Chami. And Dr. Ralph Chami is assistant director of the Institute for Capacity Development at the International Monetary Fund or the IMF, as it's more popularly known as. And uh, like I said, fairly new concept, the blue carbon movement. Um, and it's been on the minds of scientists like Dr. Heidi Pearson and also on the minds of the big money changers, Wall Street, Big Ag. I want to welcome Dr. Ralph Chami to A Rude Awakening. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, this is a, this is a heavy conversation. So just to break it down, now there's the article that, um, that you wrote with your colleagues, uh, the IMF article entitled Nature's Solution to Climate Change. Now, that came out in December of 2019, was about six, seven months after uh, Dr. Heidi Pearson's article came out in theconversation.com. And it's, uh, it goes into the numbers. It goes into to starting the, the, the commodification of what monies are going to, or how much it's going to cost to try and save the whales, um, et cetera. And I want to quote, let's see here, uh, the last part of it. Um, if we agree to pay this cost of $13 per person to, to uh, per year to subsidize uh, the whales CO2 sequestration efforts, we agree to pay the cost. How should it be allocated across countries, individuals, and businesses? What I thought was really amazing and important about this article that you wrote with your colleagues, Dr. Chami, is the fact that you're asking these questions. You're asking these very, very important questions. So um, let's drill down right away. What is that $13 per year per person? Is that per person on the face of this earth? Let's go ahead and start there. Go ahead. Yes, uh, it is. The, the, the issue what we're facing, if you allow me just to step back a little, um, the scientists such as Heidi and others knew for a long time, actually, if, I, if my reading is correct, uh, since Andy Pershing's 2010 paper, in the case of the whales, their contribution in terms of the carbon on their body, and later work uh, through Heidi and Joe Roman and others in terms of the fertilization of the phytoplankton. But uh, so we, one could ask, well, the, you know, the whales are contributing in terms of carbon sequestration in the fight against climate change. So one could start there. Uh, for me, as a financial economist, and for my, uh, for my, uh, if you like, my tribe, <laughs> the financial world and policy policy circles, they don't understand the benefits that basically were in the science. Meaning, we we understand very well when we say we need to protect the whales or we need to protect the mangroves, seagrass, salt marsh. The first thing that occurs to you is how much is this going to cost. That is well understood. What was not very well understood is what the scientists already knew, that the whales, in the case of the whales, but we could be talking about mangroves, seagrass, salt marshes, also help in terms of carbon sequestration, which is also valuable to us. 
that those benefits were in the realm of science. So the conversation was the cost was in dollars to protect a, a whale or a mangroves or a salt marsh, but the benefit was residing in the language of scientists, apples and oranges. So what I was doing with my colleagues, and I happened on this by happening to be on a research vessel in uh, who were interested in blue whales in the Sea of Cortez, where I discovered this conversation was already taking place about what the, what the blue whales or other great whales were doing in terms of carbon sequestration. So the question I had as a financial economist, can I value their contribution? Somebody is providing, in this case, the whales are providing service to society. Is this service valuable beyond their intrinsic value as a, as a living creature? Are they doing something that they should be paid for? That's simple. I work for the IMF. They pay me a salary. I provide economic services. They pay me a salary at the end of the month or at the end of the year. Well, here's a whale that's providing a service to society. Is that service, in the case of carbon sequestration, is it valuable? And the answer is, of course it is. If, you, if you're talking about the COP26, I, just, I, was, I was there for the past uh, 10 days or so. They all, the, the Paris Accord is all about how do we grab carbon from the atmosphere or how do we reduce our emissions and how do we grab whatever the stock that already exists in the atmosphere that to me as an economist says there's an insatiable demand for carbon reduction and carbon sequestration and we need to do this by 2030 by 2040 or 2050 so that's a date and time that is moving towards us at a very fast speed so that's demand for carbon sequestration. Question is, do what is the technology out there for grabbing carbon? Well, you have two options there. You have high tech or you have what we like to think as earth tech or nature. High tech, we don't know anything about. We hear a lot, as Greta says, a lot of blah, blah, blah. We're going to do this. We're going to invent this machine, that machine. We don't even know if that machine, while grabbing carbon, if it were to grab carbon, won't do even more damage. But what's out there, and we know for sure, is the ocean. Ocean is four-fifths of the planet. People tend to forget that. And the scientists would tell you it, it's a carbon sink, grabs about 25% of all uh, ma uh, human-produced uh, carbon dioxide. So the, the ocean is out there, and it already grabs carbon. So, And if you add to it land, if you like, you end up with about 30, 37% according to the IPCC report. So nature is out there saying, I can provide you with that technology to meet the, the demand to grab carbon from the atmosphere. And again, that demand is coming from the Paris Accord and the commitments of countries to go carbon zero. You hear it now all the time. We're going to be net carbon emitters. We're going to be negative carbon emitters. To us, to economists, that means there's a demand for such a technology. Nature is saying, if you give me, if you give me a chance, if you <laughs> give me a breather, I can help you sequester that carbon. So you have demand, you have supply. So what I did in the case of the of the whales, we said, well, how much is this carbon sequestration service of the whale worth to us? Okay, using whatever data was available, we estimated it to be a minimum actually of two million dollars because at the time I was doing it. 2018, 19, the metric price of carbon was $24. If you look, if you were to Google it today on the European exchange trading system, it's $63. The price of tonnage of carbon dioxide keeps rising and it will continue to rise into the hundreds, if not into the thousands. So the value, if you were to pay a whale, in theory, for its services, Right? It goes to work by living its life. It grabs carbon. How much would you have to pay it or pay those that look after the whale for the services that it's providing humanity? And the answer is a minimum of $2 million. By the way, by the way uh, as Heidi knows very well, the whales not only help sequester carbon, they do a lot of other things that are very important. But we just focused in the, in the case of the great whales on carbon sequestration, impact on fish stocks, and whale tourism. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So with that cost-benefit analysis, I was just looking on uh, online earlier today, and those uh, exchange-traded exchange funds, or ETFs, uh, they're, they're down today. 
they're down today, yes. but yes. they're going but- up. I mean, if you look at the month trend, they're, they're doing pretty well. Um, uh, as of October, I think, uh, I forget which one it is, uh, uh, starts with a K or something like that. Um, they just got on, started publicly trading as of uh, October, right before COP started. Now that COP right. is over, those stocks are down. Um, what does that say about the possible early investment in carbon sequestration? Well, if you if you look at uh, carb, uh, ETS, which is the European uh, t- uh, trading system for carbon, there's insati- that price is continuously rising. In fact, the Bank of England was uh, study was saying the price will be in the hundreds. In fact, economists that are working on this will tell you the price ought to be much higher. Why? Because it is the price that we would need to charge. Um, companies and polluters to change their behavior Uh, such that we don't exceed the 1.5 degrees. Mm -hmm. But the the price is so high that it's politically not necessarily feasible because when the price is that high, that means, um, you know, industries are going to be screaming uh, bloody murder because they're they're going to be saying how are we going to come up with how are we going to pay that cost we you know if we if we try to absorb that cost we're going to go out of business blah 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 all this stuff but what it's really saying is we need to go beyond the price system Mm -hmm. if we are going to fight the climate change Mm -hmm. okay and here in the case of the value of the whale in terms of carbon sequestration of two million was basically to say that nature that's alive and well is far more valuable to us than a dead whale. We already have a price, by the way, for a whale. People always ask me that. I say there's already a price and the price is zero. Mm. Proof of con- proof if today a ship were to hit a whale today, secure it on the bow and, and sail into the port of Los Angeles, let's say the most magnificent, the greatest of them all is the blue whale, will pay no price. There's no penalty. So the price that society has associated to the life of a blue whale currently is zero. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is when we look at their service to humanity, service that we care about, especially our own existence, because we need to grab carbon to survive, the whales should be paid a minimum of $2 million. Okay? And we can do the same with elephants. We can do the same thing with mangroves, seagrass, salt marshes. The ocean is a huge carbon sink, but it has been absent from the discussion for the most part in terms of fighting climate change. It started to, to come in when the Chileans were, were had the presidency of the COP25 back in Madrid, uh, in Madrid two years ago, when they brought the idea forward that the that the ocean is not only a victim of climate change, but the ocean could hold the key to helping us reduce climate change risk. At this COP26, there was much more discussion about the role of the ocean and everything that resides in the ocean, including the whales and and non cetaceans. Mm-hmm. Okay, so with that cost benefit analysis, uh, it, it sounds like it's it's um, becoming a thing. It is a thing. It's on the market. Yep. It's on. It's being publicly traded ETFs and what have you. Um, so there is a future in it, as far as big ag is concerned, as far as investors are concerned. So, what does that? Or I know you're an economist, Dr. Ralph Chomi, but and if you can answer this question, great. If you can't, Dr. Heidi Pearson, please go ahead and weigh in. What is that going to look like for the whales, though? Are we talking about there's going to be like Franken whale farms created <laughs> to ensure that these investors see some type of return? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like, oh, you know, you got Joe Blow down the street who's got his, uh, right. you know, his portfolio and you know he's got his uh you know his green peace buddy who's like you should invest in this and he's like all right cool yeah i'm gonna do that and he you know puts in a couple grand or whatever and and you know he's gonna want that he's gonna want to see some type of return on that couple of grand that he's investing yep and so, in fact, so how, you, sorry yeah. sorry go ahead sorry go ahead they, they will see the return, but how will the return accrue? This, this, this paradigm accrues from actually allowing the whale to live their life 
right. as nature deemed right. them to. It's Thank not you. it's not about tying a whale to a rock and saying, I have a living whale, pay me money. No, not at all. It's the same thing when we when we have, uh, you know, just think about right now con- um, countries that are selling carbon sequestration of their forests under the Red Agreement, Red Plus. You can sell the carbon offsets from your forests as long as your forests are healthy you can sell that and the money comes in to basically to to look after the forests and the, and the, presumably the communities and the indigenous population who are really the stewards of these forests there are experiments of this all over the world now even in california there were additionality forests that i believe microsoft paid for of course all of them went up in flames when the fires came so the ocean yet doesn't burn. So the way we would do it in the case of the whales is that the whales, you're not selling the whales. You're, you're basically paying the whales for their service. But their service can only accrue if the whales are free. These are great whales. You can't put them in an aquarium. You shouldn't put any creature, by the way, in an aquarium. It's against my principles anyway. They were meant to live freely as nature wanted them to. So... Basically, what you're really doing is saying, well, these whales are responsible for X amount of carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide being sequestered is sold. Sold to whom? Sold to companies that have made commitments to offset their carbon footprint. So let's let's say for the sake of, as an example, let's say Microsoft says, commits to offsetting its carbon footprint. Let's say 100 tons a, a, a year. That would be the service of you know, in this case, two whales or three great whales. Who, the, the Microsoft deposits the money in, in the case of the country where these whales spend most of their time or into a global fund, that fund. And, and what Microsoft gets in return, it gets to say, I offset my carbon footprint and I'm also helping to save the whales. The money that sits in that global fund or national fund goes to look after the whales in perpetuity to fund the science that is much needed, the science of Heidi and others, and to compensate uh, whoever gets, you know, is impacted by the presence of these whales and by the increase in their numbers. Now, as to how to increase the numbers of whales, my answer is very simple. Leave them alone. (laughs) In what sense? Whales are not dying from being overfished. That whaling has stopped. They're dying, and Heidi can correct me, from ship strikes, from plastic pollution, from uh, a noise pollution, from being caught in, in, in fish nets and ghost nets. That's what's killing the whales. So right. when, if you want to fight, if you want to have more whales, you have to stop this bad behavior by humans. Mm-hmm. Leave them alone. They can recuperate. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Well... Uh, we are running out of time. I've got one more question for you, though, Dr. Jomi. And of course, Dr. Heidi Pearson, chime in if you like. Um, and this is from the uh, the IMF paper that uh, Dr. Jomi wrote with his colleagues. It came out in December of 2019. And I quote, international financial institutions in partnership with other UN and multilateral organizations are ideally suited to advise, monitor, and coordinate the actions of countries in protecting whales. Whales are commonly found in the waters around low-income and fragile states, countries that may be unable to deal with the needed mitigation measures. Okay, so with that, uh, what stopgap measures should be employed, in your opinion, Dr. Chami, and of course, Dr. Pearson, please chime in if you like, um, what stopgap protections should be employed to keep multinational corporations from allowing their greed, like Microsoft, like his green revolution, Bill Gates' green revolution in Africa, don't get me started, from allowing their greed to take control? How do we keep them in line? How are they kept in line? How would the United Nations keep them in line? How would the IMF be employed to keep them in line? Would there be any stopgap protections? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Tommy? Go ahead. In, in terms of when we wrote that article, what we had in mind is to make sure that the that the, uh, countries, basically, let's just go back quickly to what is the concept here. The concept is that nature that is alive and thriving is far more valuable to us than a dead nature. Meaning, leave if you leave things in the ocean, they're far more valuable to us, in, not only morally, ethically, but also monetarily. So, 
once we once we have that concept in mind, a regenerative view of nature is what we're pushing for versus the current system, which is an ex- extractive view of nature. We only value things when we kill them, chop them down, take them out of the ocean or pump things out of the ground. We're saying just the opposite. If you leave things in the ocean, on land, you are likely to generate even more income than before. Why now? Because the science is telling us and new things such as Heidi's work and others' work that is revealing incredible things about nature and living nature. Now, to your question, what we worry about is that low-income countries, fragile states, may be lulled into selling those natural assets. What we are saying to them is keep the natural assets with you. Sell only the services you have, for example, you have, if you have forests in your country, you don't want to sell the forest. You want to sell the carbon, the carbon service of your forest. If you have elephants, we discovered that elephants capture carbon in the forest. You're selling the carbon of the elephants, not the elephants themselves. Same thing if the whales, in this case, the whales are, we look at them as a national public good because as Heidi pointed out, in the case of the humpbacks, they migrate. So what you really need is a global fund that sells the carbon on behalf of these whales, the money comes in, the money comes in to look after the whales in perpetuity and thereby look after the stewards of nature in perpetuity. This is the second principle, which means the local population and indigenous population in perpetuity. That's incredibly important. Once you start to bring markets, be it offsetters, individual offsetters, uh, companies themselves, or you bring in the capital markets, is that that money has to come in in a way to ensure two things, that the assets, in this case nature, is looked after in perpetuity, and the people that live the, in the local communities, the indigenous population, are looked after in perpetuity. <laughs> Right, 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 right. But there are so many. Hi, Dr. Heidi Pearson, go ahead. You got something to say? You go ahead and say it. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sabrina. Yeah, and just to follow off on some of the latter parts of this discussion here, I think it's certainly good and appropriate to incentivize whale conservation. But it's important to, to remember that we're actually talking about increasing whale populations beyond what they are now. So, there are incentives to protect whales in terms of having more sustainable fishing gear or marine protected areas, reducing noise pollution, um, having slower uh, speeds through shipping zones, reducing pollution, which of course it, you know causes climate change, which is also affecting whales directly. So we need to incentivize their conservation through putting additional protective measures in place that will help these whale populations to increase. And we know that whales are really big, they live a long time, and they also have a very slow lifestyle. They have a, a slow reproductive rate, so they're not going to increase in population overnight. I mean, these have to be long-term conservation measures in place to get these whale populations uh, increasing. And then the final thing I wanted to say that I always try to, to bring up is that it's, it's really important to protect and conserve whales. And we think they have these amazing carbon benefits, but also um, it shouldn't be in place of doing other things that we know directly reduce CO2 levels. Um, you know, So all these things that we can do to directly reduce greenhouse gas emissions should be done alongside of these more uh, innov- innovative nature-based solutions to let nature also serve as a carbon sink. Ah, yes, the lovely carbon sink. Gosh. Nature, nature is there, Sabrina. Nature is is there. It's saying, why don't you, why don't you allow me to help you? Help you in the fight against climate change. Mm -hmm. It is the only home you'll ever know. Carl Sagan used to say it's the only only home we've ever known. It's the only home we'll ever know, despite all the rockets that we shoot off from the planet. Mm -hmm. Uh, At least in in the foreseeable future, this is our only home and we have to treat it as such. Well, you know, Dr. Chomi um, and Dr. Pearson, um, you you both fill me with hope and uh, you both are in your respective positions and we're all better for it. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's keep this let's get let's keep this going. Let's keep this positivity going because you know 
there are those entities out there that are only looking at the bottom line and it's unfortunate and and you know as we move forward we need to all keep in mind that those are the bad guys <laughs> and what we're trying to do is is for the good it's for the good of the planet and uh, they need to understand them it's about changing their hearts and their minds assuming that they have a heart um, they definitely have a mind but anyway we're going to go ahead and close it out you guys this was a great conversation miss heidi pearson thanks for breaking it down professor appreciate you being on the show thank you so much and dr ralph chami breaking it down with the dollars and cents and the numbers and percentages that always confuse me ah. <laughs> Folks, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Truly appreciate you taking the time, both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Serena, good, good, to, good to see you, or good to hear you, Heidi, again. <laughs> you too, Ralph. Mm. Interesting conversation. And the first of many, of course, because, you know, if past is prologue, then poorer nations will have to fight hard to keep from bearing the brunt of the carbon offset costs, especially since the bulk of emissions were and are created by the richer Western nations. And that is where the conversation is being directed at this point. And it's like the it's like the Wild West all over again. And we're going to close out the show with an Al Jazeera clip from November 2nd of this year, where climate activist and executive director for Greenpeace Southeast Asia, Yeb Sanyo, breaks it down. Uh, let me just share with you a tweet from Yeb. If you're at COP26, beware of the carbon offsetting lies being peddled there. COP26 basics. Why refuse to collude with the polluters in the carbon offsetting lie? What are the lies, Yeb? Oh, uh, there's tons of lies. And uh, one, one of the most important things is that uh, it, it, is, it is being heralded as a magic wand. It is not a magic wand. It is definitely not gonna solve the climate, and uh, it it it, uh, it is over it being oversold as uh, as the solution to climate change by by saying that you know we need market forces to solve the climate crisis. Well, it's it's the market forces that has brought us into this crisis in the first place. And offsetting, I agree with Kara, and I'm happy that uh, she mentioned uh, the the entire. Um, uh, at the core of this problem is how human rights are being violated. And one of those lies is that uh, the Global South is going to benefit from all, all of these offsetting projects. Well, offsetting has a long and well-documented history of problems, not just in terms of uh, how they deliver genuine uh, benefit for the climate, uh, but uh, the, a, a long history of negative impacts for land rights, social justice for marginalized communities, and, and also for biodiversity in many countries, and what 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 is uh, what is uh, least uh, not understood well here is that if you talk about offsets, they're going to happen mostly in the global south, as uh, Shushi has uh, correctly pointed out earlier. We're, we're really concerned that many of the historic problems that have happened with uh, all of these offsetting projects uh, and the you know the broader risk of undermining the climate goals um, is it will be exacerbated by. Uh, the growing corporate and political enthusiasm for all of these market initiatives. Uh, and that is that is a distraction from what needs to be done, as we keep saying. Uh, and and uh, at the heart of this, as, as Chiara uh, had uh, emphasized, is uh, the fossil fuel industry. And and I'm, I'm aghast with the, the notion that the fossil fuel industry wants to offset their emissions. You know, if I even set aside... Uh, my my disbelief about offsets, um, and and let's say it can work technically. I I think forest projects, meaning all of this offset where we we have to plant trees to offset the emissions from the fossil fuel industry, is just unacceptable for me. I would say that we should focus, for example, on on solar power, on on renewable energy, and and those things are easier to account, and therefore uh, we can avoid those lies. Mm, yeah, how is this different from climate financing? Why isn't carbon offsetting climate financing? Well, climate financing is, is a broader term that may include as a subset uh, financing that goes into carbon uh, uh, trading and also therefore carbon offsetting. Mm. Um, well, climate financing by its strict definition under the UN Climate Convention 
is is financial resources, money that should be provided by rich countries uh, or what is listed as Annex 2 countries of the Climate Convention uh, to developing countries, poorer countries who are at the receiving end uh, of, the, uh, of the climate impacts uh, so that they can also leapfrog uh, into a cleaner kind of development and also adapt to the impacts of climate change. That is an obligation under the UN Climate Convention and the Paris Agreement has also made it very clear that uh, developed countries need to mobilize as much as uh, at least $100 billion per year uh, by 2020 uh, up to 2025 if uh, we're talking about money here that needs to be used uh, to, to generate that kind of, uh, of transition and that kind of transformation towards cleaner development and also al allow countries to cope uh, with the impacts of climate change. That is climate finance. When we talk about offsets, this is not real climate finance because uh, what we're what we're talking uh, about here is this is basically money being thrown at the problem. It is not money being being used to solve the problem. Again, that was the voice of Yeb Sanyo, Executive Director of Greenpeace Southeast Asia. And that conversation again, folks, has not ended. It's just begun. Gun. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. Big thank you to my guests, Dr. Heidi Pearson and Dr. Ralph Chami for taking the time. Man of Steel, Rod Akeel is on the controls. I'll be back next week, same time, same place. The music on today's show was Jay Tillman with Crosswinds. Stay tuned for a rebroadcast of Democracy Now! coming up next. And remember, good people, embrace each other as we embrace the mother of us all. Thank you for listening. and organizations recognize that leadership does not have to correspond to conventional modes of leadership, uh, uh, conventional forms of leadership that value the charismatic uh, individual male uh, <laughs> leader. <laughs> They recognize collective leadership. They recognize women's leadership. They recognize black women's leadership. They recognize queer black women's leadership. Advancing the conversation to abolish racism for over 70 years. 94.1 KPFA. The 50th annual KPFA Holiday Benefit Craft Fair is coming up at the end of November. Our awesome team of volunteers ensures the event runs smoothly by helping out with light duties around the fair, and we would love for you to join us. Volunteers will be asked to present proof of vaccination or negative PCR test upon arrival. Masks are required for everyone regardless of vaccination status. For more information and to sign up, go to brainwaycraftfair.com slash volunteer.
listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FZ in Monterey, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 